much does Jackson and the Nuremberg trial relate to to you, Bill? It's uh, Jackson and Nuremberg is huge for me, um, and I mean, you can check it out in my writing or when I when I lecture. It's really very very central um, because I mean one, my biggest my first big book in the field of international criminal law is on genocide, and of course Jackson was he used the word at the London conference um, in 1945. But as you know the 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 charter of the Nuremberg Tribunal speaks about crimes against humanity, and of course that's the crime against humanity of extermination, which was I think. If, if you'd ask Jackson, are you prosecuting genocide, he would say, sure, it's the crime against humanity of, of extermination. In fact, he did say it essentially during the, during the London Conference in June and July of, of 1945. Um, but I think that the, uh, the, the, that the story of international criminal law over the last 65 years, a big part of it has been what I call the relationship between genocide and crimes against humanity, which remains to this day. Um, we have uh, regularly, you know, quarrels about is something a genocide? The term gets used, and then people say no, it's better described as a crime against humanity. And then someone says, oh, only a crime against humanity. Of course, I don't think Jackson would have said only a crime against humanity. He would have said that's about it. So, I think that the role of Jackson and that Nuremberg period is is it's not only um, seminal in the sense of starting; it's it's the beginning. But it's also seminal in terms of uh, framing the, the debates. Um, very, very important period. And now, as, uh, as our interest refocuses a little bit on, the, uh, on crimes against peace and the issue of aggression, of course, Jackson, of course, is very central to that as well. So he's a, he's a very important person in my, in my narrative of international criminal law. At, this, at the beginning, in 1945, uh, aggression uh, it was then called crimes against peace, although they used the term aggression uh, at the time as well, was uh, considered the, almost the glue that, that, that put the case against the Nazis together. That was, the, that was the, the, the central theme. And then all the other atrocities were viewed as being associated with that kind of overarching theme of their big crime was waging an aggressive war. And that's been probably, that vision of international crimes has probably been, been, been changed over the years. So that we focused more on the specific violations and on, on um, atrocity crimes committed in peacetime or in, in, in civil wars. And, and so we've lost a little bit of that. And when the International Criminal Court was being created in 1998, at the Rome conference, there was the there was the list of crimes that essentially came from Nuremberg, Jackson's list, although it had uh, slight changes in the terminology and definition. Uh, but we couldn't agree on on whether to include aggression uh, or crimes against peace in the uh, in, in the in the uh, statute of the International Criminal Court. And some, you know, there were there were many, including the big human rights NGOs, who said it's better not just leave it alone. And then there were many others. I don't think they said it in the name of honoring the legacy of Jackson so much as, but it was it was very much that this was all a, a cohesive package back in uh, 1945, and and it it had to be retained. So we went through then after the Rome Statute was adopted, a dozen years of negotiating, trying to figure out whether and how aggression would be included in the in the within the law applicable to the International mm -hmm. Criminal Court. And so the Kampala Conference did it. And uh, I would say I was there from beginning to end, I would say until the last hour, you couldn't um, find someone prepared to bet serious money on it being included. It was a very surprising outcome. And I think we'll look back on it saying, well, it was surprising because there was so much disagreement about it, but that someone looking at the big picture would know that it couldn't have turned out otherwise, that it had to be included. But it, it really was quite, uh, um, uh, you know, unexpected that, that, that it would be included. And uh, maybe that was just because it was, you know, like Victor Hugo said, uh, you know, nothing can stop an idea whose time has come, but it, yeah. it, it had to be done. But, but it was quite a surprising outcome. So it, whether it'll ever be prosecuted again is another question, whether, whether the, 
whether it'll become a useful tool for prosecutors yeah. and be used by the court remains to be seen. But I think the idea of, of, of putting it back there on the, on the list, making it clear that this is a, you know, a, a central violation of international law, it can only have positive uh, impact for, for, for world peace, for the international community. But I think it's a, I'm very happy about the development. And I think it's good for the court which uh, has been, um, you know, it's been hurting, it's been struggling, the International Criminal Court. It hasn't uh, uh, developed and, and hasn't prospered uh, as much as people had hoped. Uh, so here we are now, seven, eight years after it starts, they still haven't finished a trial. The trial they're supposed to start is in, uh, not in terminal meltdown, but is, is still in, in having trouble. I don't think we know. I, th I think it's too early to predict what's going to happen with uh, the future of international tribunals. After the International Criminal Court statute was adopted in 98, I think there was a sense that, you know, the future was having one big universal institution and that we wouldn't need to create ad hoc, um, you know, institutions and with their own, you know, uh, you know, sort of creatively tailored to the situation where the, uh, the uh, where the where justice was to be delivered and um, the I think had the court the International Criminal Court been more uh, successful and more robust and more in in the first seven or eight years of its operation that that argument people would say well yeah that's it's clear but you know there was an example I'll give you an example five years ago there was a report within uh, produced in the UN to deal with Darfur. It was uh, uh, the chair of the committee that drafted it was Antonio Cassesi, who was the first president of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And it was at a time when we were discussing what to do with how to bring international criminal justice to bear on the crisis in Darfur. Mm -hmm. So at the time the US was still fairly lukewarm, maybe lukewarm is even being too generous towards the International Criminal Court. So the US was taking the position, we're talking January of, nine, of 2005, was saying this isn't for the International Criminal Court, this is for another ad hoc type tribunal. And that was the position being taken by the US. The Europeans and others in the, in the Security Council followed this report which said don't go to another ad hoc tribunal because they're too slow and cumbersome and, and it'll take too long. Go to the International Criminal Court, which is lean and mean and efficient. That was January of 2005. So the pro-International Criminal Court people carried the day in the UN. I mean, it was politics, of course. And the US, and this was one of the first signs that US position was evolving towards the International Criminal Court, the US could have vetoed that. But, but finally it abstained, and, and in effect, when the U.S. abstains in a resolution at the Security Council, it's as good as a yes vote, because they're letting, it, they're letting whatever it is go, go through. They're kind of reserving their view politically, but, but they're letting it go ahead. And um, so that was the decision. That decision was taken in March of, of uh, 2005. Mm -hmm. But finally, the International Criminal Court hasn't been very effective in dealing with Darfur. It's, mm -hmm. It makes noise. It's made a lot of noise. The prosecutor's good at it, and he, he denounces and complains and howls in outrage, but not much happens because, because of the politics of the situation. And the question is, you know, looking back, it's hindsight, of course, but if in 2005 we had have said, followed the U.S. position and said, yes, why don't we give this to an African court? or an African-inspired court or something, some, some new creative version of a, of a temporary ad hoc tribunal, would we be further advanced with international justice in Darfur? Well, nobody will know the answer to that, but I think that if you put that on the table, people would scratch their heads and say, yeah, maybe, maybe we should have done that.